Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Naomai, Harimai, and welcome to the first Urban Room event. Yay! Yay. Woo. Not loud. Not loud, okay. Speak closer. Um, so I, I'd just like to welcome you all here and also our, our, our esteemed guests who will come up on the stage shortly. I'm just um, wanting, before I go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge Nati Fatua o Oraki and their special place in this city and on this land. And in particular, um, I'd really like to acknowledge Apaha Teikawa, who was the paramount chief of Ngāti Fatua. And in 19, 1840, it was Apaha Teikawa who, having signed the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tūriti of Waitangi, in, um, very soon after, climbed up Mongafo with the young Governor Hobson, and and he made a tuki, tuku, a, a strategic gift. He stood there and he gifted 3,400 acres of land for European settlement. And it's from that beginning that our city of Auckland has begun. And Auckland is now the urban heart of the larger region of Tanaki Makoro, a place known as being loved by many. Some would say by too many. And some places have definitely not loved nearly enough. And so that is why we've started the Urban Room, a place to talk about our city and to acknowledge the importance of, of how the growth of our city happens. The, the um, how do we build in this place is so important. How do we shape our city? How do we make places that people do love? And so with the Urban Room, we're hoping to address these topics. And so who are we, the Urban Room? We, we are, I am Julie Stout, um, and I'm on the Committee of Urban Auckland with Ben Van Bruggen, Pip Cheshire, and Jeremy Hansen and Tessa Ford. Can't see them. But, um, and what I'm going to do now is hand over to Ben to talk a bit about the Urban Room. And then Simon and our guests will come on stage to talk about housing and how we fix this crisis. Just the beginning of a series of talks on the subject. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ben. Um, yeah, my name is Ben Van Bruggen, uh, and I'm one of the founders of the Urban Room. Um, and welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this. Um, you know, you're never quite sure if we're going to get two people or 200. We'll be there for 200, so that's fantastic. Shows the importance of the conversations that we are going to be having. Um, I do need to thank Julie, Pitt, Tessa, and Jeremy for kind of being guides in this and how it's working. But cities are a collaborative and a collective effort, and there's been a lot of people who have been involved and supporting it. Um, we, are, we now have some principal partners, and so Razine is one of our founding partners, so thanks to Razine for, for backing this idea. Uh, they didn't need to, but they have done, which is fantastic. Um, why do we exist? Well, we think that we need some better conversations about this city and about cities in general in Aotearoa. How are we going to face the challenges, climate change, quality, housing, transport, and many more things? And we think that by coming together, having some conversations with people who are the right people in the right place at the right time, we can actually progress change in the city. Um, we're about promoting the better outcomes for the city design and for city development, and fostering some of that collective vision. And we're doing it through debates, discussion, and discourse about what we all want collectively for the future of the city. Um, our membership is growing, so thank you to all of those who subscribe. There's some leaflets around, and please do subscribe. Uh, we are getting some newsletters out there, and there will be other things about um, events that are coming up. And at the moment, as we grow this membership, we're going to grow our events, we're growing our partners, and eventually we will have a physical space, which will be the urban room, at which we can come together on a, on a, um, as a permanent base for the urban room. So, um, yeah, thank you all for, for attending. I'm hoping this is going to be one of many of events to come. 
Um, and uh, yeah, keep, keep kind of watching this space. And anybody who wants to join, be a partner, put some uh, funding towards it, then um, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. They were putting out extra seats just before, which I think is just one of the best things that happens. I've been to a lot of election meetings in the last few weeks and it doesn't happen very often, but we had me here just now, so what a thrilling way to start the urban room. You guys should be very proud on the organising committee. Um, we're going to talk about how to fix the housing crisis in 40 and 50 minutes. <laughs> in fact, we'll do it in half an hour, shall we? <laughs> we'll have a go at it. Um, I'm joined uh, on the stage here by uh, three people. Um, and we're going to hear from each of them in a brief presentation, uh, introductory presentation, and then we're going to have a conversation. Um, and of course, you are all welcome to join that. So um, I think probably at any stage, if people have things they want to ask, um, stick up your hand. We'll get the mic, this mic to you uh, because this has been recorded. So don't just shout, wait for the mic and we'll see if we can evolve how it works in that way. Now, I have with me Helen Robinson, who is the Mummy Taiki. You might know that title as Chief Executive at the Auckland City Mission. Um, professor Lawrence Murphy, who is a Professor of um, Geography in the School of Environment in the Faculty of Science at the University of Auckland. Uh, and Mark Todd, who is co-founder and CEO of Ockham Residential. Um, I'm going to start with uh, Larry, um, and then go to Mark, and we'll end with Helen, and then we'll have our conversation. So, Larry, the floor is yours. <coughs> Glad to stand up. You, you can, I, don't, I, don't um, I just wonder if I have sound you? on. Can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. back. Okay, so uh, I've just returned from a trip to Europe, so if I, feel, if I sound incoherent, I will blame it on the jet lag, um, but my students probably explain it as my normal state of being. Uh, so as a academic, I, I am under, under the Education Act required to be the critic and conscience of society. Therefore, I don't know how to solve anything, but I know how to criticize everything. And so I'm going to start off with four provocations. And I thought, just as a way of introduction, that maybe we can think about and discuss a bit later. I'm assuming that we all, we're all here because we believe that there is something called a housing crisis, that housing crisis is manifested in many different ways, house crisis, affordability, uh, exclusion, uh, homelessness, people living in, in, in a whole range of uh, uh, poor conditions, etc. So what I want to do is just look at some provocations. And the first provocation, I would argue, is that the orthodox housing policy that's being pursued in New Zealand, that's based on the idea that if we deregulate planning, if that we increase the consenting process and make it easier, we'll increase supply, and the housing supply increase will reduce prices, is, is a fallacy. It, it is in, inappropriate. It fails to take account the basic economics of residential development. It assumes that residential developers will build into a declining house prices. And that's not the case. And I used to be, I used to teach property economics for years, uh, for 10 years. And so uh, property development processes respond to price signals. And we see rapid increases in housing production in periods of price increases, not decline. So there's a fallacy, it's a problem in the logic. So I'd argue that the policies being pursued are problematic. Secondly, I would argue that the nature of home ownership has changed radically since the 1980s and the emergence of what is called uh, residential capitalism or the belief that housing can provide us with an income that in, traditionally our, our understanding of housing was that it was a form of entry into citizenship in a sense it was a measure of our citizenship and it was a store of wealth and savings for old age but now it's seen as a fungible asset that gives you a return an income your home becomes an income and as long as we subscribe to that what we're demanding is that houses must increase, like an investment, three, five, seven percent per annum. And so we're ensuring 
that it will, even as we as homeowners, as, as potential homeowners, as, as a whole range of agents, we're inter we are committed to house prices increasing. And if that is the case, then you're always going to have a housing affordability crisis. And I would argue that underpinning that financialization is the changing nature of the mortgage market and the role of the bank. So I think in many of the discussions I've had over the last 20 years, banks are absolved from any involvement in the housing crisis. But I do think that they need to be looked at. If we look at COVID-19, we look at the relaxation of CURD in the, in the flow of mortgage finance. Uh, on average, the, the new originations of mortgage increased from 5 billion a month to over 8 billion. And that had a huge impact. It increased house prices dramatically during COVID. And so house prices and the role of banks need to be looked at. So how do we address affordability issues? I think we need to examine and reassess the nature of residential capital. We need capitalism. We need to consider what is the purpose of housing. And we need to consider uh, the types of housing that we provide and the tenures. I think we need to challenge the notions that it is about an investment return. And I think we need to develop new forms of tenures that uh, maybe alter the way in which the financial returns. We need to introduce uh, different forms of home ownership, different forms of renting. We need to look at community land trust, the relationship between land and housing. I'm happy to look at those issues if people have questions. And I think we also need to reimagine the role of the state. I mean, the state has now has, uh, assumed the role of a kind of ambulance service, dealing with those in greatest need for the duration of need. And that, I think, is problematic. I think the state is um, can produce a variety of different roles in which it's occupied in the past, both as a supplier of mortgage funding, but also as a provider of housing. I think those are things that we need to look at. I think we need to challenge the contemporary uh, social housing de development process, which is really about a privatization of 66% of the land of new development in, in social housing. So the shift of, of the, the KNORA's new development strategy consists of 33% private, 33% affordable, 33% social. In a sense, you're creating a privatization process of, of um, land. And I, I think they need to be challenged. Thank you. Right, Matt is hot. Matt is um, a developer committed to density done well, and he builds it, tries to build it. Now, um, and has, is on record as saying he's frustrated at having to dance on eggshells to get round the view that new buildings next to old buildings should echo the past. Now, Marx also said, I don't want to be involved in politics. I realise that our national discourse is rarely enriched by wealthy white guys holding forth, but I feel I've got an obligation to speak out on the housing issue. Being vertically integrated, we know a bucket load, load more than most commentators and economists about the challenges of affordable housing. And I'm sick of the solution space to housing and affordability being arbitrarily straitjacketed by urban sprawlers and RMA reform fetishists. It's dim-witted, intellectually dishonest. It's just wrong. No. <laughs> I thought I was going to be a... Conciliatory here at NZT. Uh, yeah, we've currently got 482 units under construction across five sites, and it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, <laughs> and uh, plenty more in the relatively affordable space uh, under development, uh, and uh, that's consenting at, at the present time. So I've got a fair idea of what's going on in the RMA and the planning space, the national policy statement on urban design. The, uh, the disaster that the media density residential stands to be awkward. But I wanted to start at the very top. The reason I say such incendiary things, like I just came out listening at a, you know, at a conference maybe five years ago when I was sitting there and and uh, listening to the solution space for affordable housing, and we were just confined to, you know, attacking the RMA or the at the time the district plan. And I did a quick Google search as far as I could tell. My business five years ago I was paying more tax than Microsoft, Google, Facebook. And who to combine in this country, you know, and, and so I want to start at the top. But I, I think, unfortunately, the internet revolution and technology um, has led to the opportunity to centralise 
and funnel wealth to the very top. I think that's a key issue. I, 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 there's a few steps down, but I do think that overall housing is the canary in a, in a coal mine, which you see a dysfunctional macroeconomy, and that's that's the origin of why I don't want to talk about. Like I've got good news on on zoning and town planning and construction costs and competition and so forth, but I, I think the bigger issue is that the modern world technology has exploded and that's brought many, many benefits. Um, but it's also unfortunately resulted in a world that concentrates capital and wealth. Um, and it's coinciding with a period of political decay in my view over my adult lifetime for the last 25 years. So our politicians now are, I, I think, we're probably one of the better countries in the world still, but I still don't think we really have a strong conception of what the public good is. And um, if you did, you wouldn't have. You imagine, for example, if our, our literacy or numeracy rates slowly halved over a 10 year period, there'd be a Royal Commission of Inquiry what happens in our, in our schools and they are declining, but the you know, house, housing costs relative income have done worse than that over the last 10 years. And no one cares. You know, there's just, there's no interest. So those two things at the top of my list, how do you uh, arrest that? Um, how do you harness a modern world and technology in a modern economy that actually distributes the vast wealth that a modern economy produces? Um, and secondly, how do you stop the decline of the, the political discourse? It's, so, it's one of the ideas I like about the urban room. We should be talking, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't tell the truth. And, that's where I see it. Housing is, is the canary in the coal mine, which you see that, that the wealth transfer going on. Which brings me on to old white men. <laughs> you know, um, there's a propaganda. This is, you know, it just we need to challenge orthodoxy. There's a supply and demand issue. We need to open up more lands. There's more supply. Prices will drop. Um, there's also the supply and demand view to it, if there's a demand, any functioning market would would morph and change to fill it. And there's a huge demand for affordable housing and none being built. So you, you've got a, a real overlay of dysfunction there. And that is because virtually every large householder in this country, or all the large householders in this country, are really land developers. And the dirty secret is the money is in the land development and building the houses a hassle and it's an afterthought and it's not it doesn't drive any spatial patterning or that's where the capital's at work. Unfortunately, uh, that wealth and generation largely, you know, white wealth and property developers are down there beating the drums in Wellington about what policy should be. And one of those outcomes, we've got that MRDS, which won't result in a single affordable house that is a house lower than the ultimate median house price within the existing urban environment. Every terraced house uh, that is built is, is, is north of $1 million. So. It's actually bringing back density controls that we all decided were a bad idea and fought tooth and nail to get back in. And I want to do 40 apartments on 700 square metres. I'm still stuck in nine months in a, a resource consent, you know. So, and that is an outcome of propaganda by rich white guys, land grabbers, taking a sort of colonial, exploitative view of, of land in this country. And so that's. Sorry. <laughs> to that political decay element, which those are my top two things, the, the side effects of technology in an era of political decay where there's you know, no public discourse. Like, I mean, I could go on for a long time, I won't. Um, but I think a, la a lack of aspiration is, is uh, it's all you need to change things, is, is, is be honest about what the drivers are. Um, the way that I've distilled it in the last couple of years, I've got a new narrative like, You've got to be profitable, you won't be in business long. There's nothing wrong with making money, you have to, you're not going to be in business, but that shouldn't be the reason for doing it. There's too many buildings in the city that just maximise the number in the bottom right hand corner of the, the spreadsheet. You have to be profitable, that goes without saying. You should be aspirational. What the thing that I'm most proud about what we've done with Optum is we've made as much money as we had to to attract the equity and the tier one, hundreds of millions of dollars of tier one back debt. Yet, We've, we've done a good prop, uh, we've worked in a hard market, urban intensity, we've worked with height, you know, we've worked in the affordable space, we've made the money where it is possible. So it speaks again to that older white generation that are effectively exploited to the colonial land developers. Um, 
cousin is an afterthought. Just one other thing that needs to be kept front and foremost just to quash that supply and demand effect. Land is a finite thing, that's an obvious fact if you ever looked at a picture of the earth from the moon. Um, urban land that's serviced is extremely finite and it's extremely hard to service more. It's not a functioning supply and demand scenario where you just you can make that argument. It's just it's a non sequitur from the update. As soon as anyone talks to you about a supply and demand solution to housing value, you just walk on to the next conversation. It's sort of my advice. <laughs> Right. Helen Robinson, you know, there are several people in this room who are among my favourite authors, and I hope none of you will um, <laughs> mind if I say Helen is one of my absolute favourite authors. I got to know Helen, and I'm just going to do a little shameless plug here. Okay. Um, I got to know Helen over the last year or so because I've, um, I was commissioned to write a book about the home ground building, which is Stevens Lawson uh, building up on Hobson Street, as you probably know. Uh, I've written the book that tells the story of not just the architecture and not just the remarkable environmental um, advances of the building, uh, but the people in it who live there uh, and who work in it. Um, and in that context, I've got to know Helen um, and admire her um, through, through that whole process. One of the things she told me when I interviewed in one of our interviews was that she said Christmas Day last year, she went to all the activities of the city mission sites around town, and then I came to home ground. I spent an hour walking around on my own. I'm in a relationship with this building. You'll think I'm mad, but I went around talking to the walls and stopping. I knew to be faithful, that is what I needed to do. Helen has an understanding of the relationship between people and buildings. It's not given to all of us. Last week was the official opening of Home Ground, and Helen made an extraordinary speech. Mm -hmm. now, one of the things she noted was that when the mission had moved from its temporary accommodation up on Union Street back down to Holson Street, they did a hikoi uh, to, for everybody to come down, the staff and some of the uh, residents and so on, people they worked with. And uh, because of COVID and because there were so many people, they did the hikoi five times in the same day. She called it exhausting and very important. And I think that's probably a very mild euphemism <laughs> for what it really was. I was there for one, but you did four more. The lesson of Helen is that good work happens in this world. It's hard to do. You have to commit to the hard good work. You have to really commit to it. And when you do, things get better. It's never enough, and it never really gets easier to do the hard, good work. But things do get better because you're not alone. Helen said last week she was looking for compassion and generosity when she went into the building, but they were already there. I was just waking up to the energy. Helen. What an introduction. Um, I'm very conscious that when I stand uh, in environments like this that actually behind me are uh, uh, hundreds of people literally at the mission um, and importantly a whakapapa here in Auckland that takes the mission back 102 years uh, and I, I often think you, you talked about the modern city of Auckland that Auckland City Mission has kind of grown up with um, and I just want to acknowledge the richness of that whakapapa and the honour of which it is to be here actually with each of you today in these continued conversations. Uh, I have to assume that you have come here because your heart and your head is saying we want something different and you want to be part of conversations that actually lean into or take us as a, as a nation and as a city to that difference. So I just want to acknowledge actually each and every one of you in that conversation and uh, these two quite extraordinary people sitting to the right of me and to the left. Very. I was uh, walked down from home ground and th there was a, a strange ironic thought in my head that said I can't wait for the day where I am not invited to a conversation about housing in Auckland. Um, not that I mind so much about the invitation but as Mishnah, 
um, you can only imagine the years and years and years of conversation that we have been having about this. And uh, Mark spoke about the canary in the mine, and that was actually very much the image that I was uh, having as I was walking down here. One of the things I know, um, uh, one of the phenomenon really that exists in modern day society is that those who are powerless and poor experience something first and worst. So I'll say that again, those who are powerless and poor experience something first and worst. And this is not something that's been made up in my mind, it's actually something that has been taught and handed down to me over the years really of this kind of work that I have done. So it's, it's a very sobering thought if I was to tell you that we actually began to experience the reality of rough sleepers here in central city Auckland in the late 1980s. So we're talking 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. So you can see that there will have been a city missioner for over 30 years talking to Auckland, saying, for God's sake, you lot, would you wake up? And there is that sense in me today, and it deeply, deeply interests me that both Larry and Mark have taken this conversation in its first instance to questions of distribution of wealth. It is extraordinarily interesting that the conversation that, that I believe that is at the root of the housing crisis is that there are a group of us in this society that believe that it is important that we have more resources than others and that we will hoard that. And the cost of that decision is that some people don't have. And what is extraordinarily frightening and shaming for us as a nation, and I'm not just putting that out there, this sits deeply in my heart as well, is that that is done on lines of gender and colour. It is as clear as clear as clear. We are deep in the impact of racism. We are deep in the impact of refusing to acknowledge the equality of women, and particularly women raising children alone, and that the colonial impact is not about the past, but is about the present day. Look at people who are suffering the reality of homelessness. It is not people who are land developers. It is an extraordinary frightening reality when we are brave enough to actually look into our own collective heart to say we are creating this crisis. It is not people out there, it is us in this room, it's me. And when we are brave enough to acknowledge that reality, the deep irony for me in that is that that is the seed of our hope. If we are brave enough to actually acknowledge what is going on, and both Mark and Larry have referred to that, then actually we can begin, like the sound of music at the very beginning, and just actually say, if that is the motivator and that is the driver, how actually do we create or construct an alternate in another reality? Now, I sure as hell don't have the capital T answer. What I do know is that I have the privilege of being part of a collective of people who are saying, not only must we do something, but we will do something, and in fact, we are doing <coughs> something. So I walked down, as I said here, from home ground, officially opened on Thursday, that has built 80 apartments for social housing. 40 of those for people on what we call the Housing First programme, so the highest level of need. Now that's taken us 15 years, team, mm -hmm. to build 80 uh, social houses. What we have done when the thought of facing another another building project, as Mark said, was more like nightmare material, I have to acknowledge, even for the beauty of that building, is actually started to think, what are some other options that are available? And you may have heard recently, it was announced in the Herald, that we had taken over the long-term lease of what was Haka Hotel on Day Street, just off K Road. 
again another 60 apartments all for social housing. Now we've only managed to do that with the Ministry of, of uh, Housing and Urban Development. So this is definitely a government NGO partnership. But what that partnership means is by Christmas there will be 60 people who will have a home. When uh, actually as of Friday last week not one of those 60 did. So my plea here today is twofold. Hear very, very clearly what the core and the root drivers of this is. Our own fear. When I am afraid, I must hoard resources. I must make sure that I have something so that other people, or the impact of that is, other people don't. When we are brave enough to understand that that happens on lines of privilege and power, then we are freed to actually begin to do something. And for God's sake, we need to do something. Um, there are a couple of big things I think that have come out of the presentations we've just heard. And one of them is that question, you know, remember we're going to fix the housing crisis and uh, what the things are, and we'll talk about some of those. And I think specifically the, the medium density uh, residential standards in the RS, uh, we should have talked about that too, and what do we think about that. Um, maybe we'll come to that. <laughs> um, Helen, your challenge, the core and root driver of it is our own fear, because it leads us to hoard things. That really goes back to Larry's second point about the changing nature of home ownership and what we now expect from home ownership, um, that it's become a commodity that we want to make money from, um, rather than a market citizenship. Um, would you like to respond to that, Larry? What Helen said there? Uh, yes, I think that, uh, interestingly, if you look at the changing nature of home ownership and what, it's, what we expect from it, those changes occurred without any public discussion. Uh, there's also an inherent naturalness about that our home should be making money daily. But actually, we should look at the Herald and see how much money we've made over a period of time. So not only that, that we can go online and if you have a bank account and you happen to have a mortgage, that you can actually extend your mortgage, not to fix the house, but to buy a boat or a car or whatever. And so all of those things have become naturalized in our understandings. And, and, and so when we encounter issues of potential crisis, as Helen has indicated, we fear that you know if we change the system, that it will affect us adversely. But I think we do need to look at the next, if we're really thinking about our, the next generation and the next generation, and as, as um, Mark has indicated, the notion of public good, you know, what is it we want in the future? We need to think about, we need to, we need to think about um, a, a housing and a home ownership that has different characteristics, that is about securing people's access to appropriate conditions for life that is about ensuring that people can have stability of tenure and a whole range of other things. That it allows for uh, inclusion, for not just for, uh, it's for the next generation, for our children and the children's children. It's kind of about looking at it going forward. So I think, I think it is about the issue of, of, of grasping at um, a world that we've constructed, maybe which we didn't even vote for, um, but it's, it's now dominant. It's dominant in our thinking. I'll just give an example. I teach an environmental program. Most of my students are environmental concerned. First question I ask them is, how many would like to rent or own in Auckland? 90 plus percent say own. And I say, how many of you would like to own that house and, and it meet all your needs for your whole life? And never, never increase in price. But we'll, you will never need another house. It will mean every aspect of your life from, from now till the, till the time you die. How many would want that? Or how many would prefer to have a house that meets all your needs and increase at 5% per annum and 90% for, 
5% per annum. And these are environmentally aware people who want to talk about sustainability, but they have bought into an assumption that housing is about making money. It is about, it's not about meeting a need, of, but it's about making money. And so even though they, they've split off their lives, to in a sense, to solving the world's problems, but making sure I make a lot of money too. And that's an interesting juxtaposition. I think we need to start challenging those views. So, Mark, you build apartment blocks that try to address some of that. You build apartment blocks where there is not an expectation that people will live as they would have previously in the suburbs. Um, what do you find? Why do people come to you and buy yours? Oh, firstly, I don't want to hold myself up as um, any particularly bright. I I'm embarrassed about what it costs to build. Um, what I can deliver for, and even you know the Kiwi Build price points are not affordable to probably fifty percent of the you know. So like I, I just want to like I don't hold myself up. I, I'm embarrassed about what it costs to build, and, and we we're much more effective and cost efficient than most. Um, and I know for a fact we're about fifty percent less than Kaiangahora, so I need to get that out there in terms of. This government's got one thing right, like we need to spend billions of dollars on housing. The public narratives out there that actually New Zealand's missing more than half its social housing stock. That's something that wasn't even really on my radar until four years ago. Like the percentage of social housing in this country is woefully low, so we're on the right track. We need to be building thousands and thousands more houses. How we're delivering them is appalling. Um, and every house that's not delivered by Clangora will, will be another 1.5 houses. Um, but I think. It's just an acknowledgement of the future, and again, that, that fundamental is that the planet's getting smaller with technology. It is finite. Resources are finite. Um, quality compact cities are pretty, pretty good idea, and that was you know, a democratically consulted process for over four years. We decided that's what we want as Aucklanders, quality compact city. Um, and there is a small, in our feelings, growing choice. You know, we're onto our fifth zero car park building. You know, you know, who would have thought you could do that five or six years ago? Um, and that's the best thing you can do for climate change is live where you work or live central where you can walk to things. What? Sorry. What does the zero car park building? Oh, it does not have car park, so... Ah. Yeah, so there's, there's bicycle and um, scooter storage facilities and that's it. The challenge that Helen set down just before was our own fear is stopping us making the progress we need as a society. Mm. Yeah. And Larry mentioned voting. Yeah. It's a, the fear is locked in, isn't it? The fear is locked in, or is it? I mean, the real politic is locked in. Mm. You know, older people vote. Older people, wealthy, and, and if you follow our demographics, which I think are a key issue that everyone should have a, a, a you know a, a strong understanding of demographics over the next you know hundred out to two thousand and two thousand one hundred. But if you, you follow those things out, the wealth's being concentrated. I think it's perfectly acceptable to to over the next say generation twenty years um, incrementally discourage investment to the point where you can only own your house and perhaps a beach house. It's not an appropriate place for baby boomers' wealth to go, is, is in passively investing in housing. I, I firmly believe that. Um, and that's it's quite a big step because there's a Western tradition of valuing property rights above all else. But if, if, you, if, you, if we doggedly cling to that idea, my view is if you're a wealthy uh, baby boomer or older person, you know, of, of, you should be under an ethical obligation to invest your money in productive businesses, not not passive housing. And I don't think it's that's the opportunity to be brave enough to admit something's gone wrong, and 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 to engage in the real economy. The other so, thing we could do is do is just make sure young people get the vote a number of years earlier, because I think that's a big issue. Vote sixteen when you want to vote. Could I just uh, could I just add one thing to that comment and say that in, in addition to um, baby boomers, I think I think I think it's actually the, the banking sector is is wedded to the mortgage market 
overwhelming flow of funds from the banking sectors to mortgage market, not to the real economy. And, and they make huge amounts of resources out of it. And, and in a sense, I, I liken it to, to um, the drug dealers, uh, the tinny house. They're the tinny house of the housing market. They're the ones who supply, and yet they don't necessarily engage. They're not caught, they're not, they seem to absolve themselves of any, any engagement. And yet they, they, they are the ones who are flowing money into particular things. And if you provide the money, it becomes an incentive. It becomes part of the drug that people are investing in. So I think there is a. I think there is going forward. Uh, part of the discussion has to look at the nature of, of funding and, and the how it, how it evolved and how it's changed over time. We had a question from the floor. Just shout it out. You made a what's actually happens when we get a Labour Commission government come together and agree to plan that they would have intensification um, which is put to council, it's very difficult for the Labour Commission to push back. I, I wonder so if we could... question you on around the democratic process actually. Oh no, I think that's a complete failure. No, I, I, I've never, I've, no one consulted me about it. If they had, I would have said it's, it's, it's a silly idea. Um, so I, I was referring to the unitary plan process that was over a number of years and there was plenty of public hearings and working groups and you know and, and we, we landed it I thought it was relatively progressive that was definitely a democratic process the production of the unitary plan the MRDS was some backroom shitty deal that should never seen the light of day so let's let's talk about that now and we'll come back to the other stuff because you've raised it if I can just correct you there uh, Mark is quite right. A, in this city, a very extensive consultative process to develop the unitary plan, which brought together the district plans of the old legacy councils when the super city was formed, to develop a new unified or unitary plan uh, that suggested that something between 60 and 70 percent of the development of the city would be uh, to more density, would be the city, as Lee Brown used to say, would grow up and the rest of it would grow out. Um, it was very widely consulted as Mark says, and there was a general agreement, and I think probably across the board, really, it was pretty widely agreed. Um, council took a position on that that was a little bit timid. When it went to the independent hearings commissioners, they strengthened it. You know, they made it more dense. Uh, Mark has then noted that the um, agreement between all the parties of parliament except the ACT Party uh, to introduce the new uh, urban development regime with, with the medium density um, residential standards. The reason that was done is that it's generally regarded as too hard for councils, for, for electoral reasons, to bring in enough density to create compact cities. And the reason we need compact cities is environmental, particularly in relation to climate change, but also because compact cities allow the efficient running of cities and allow a whole lot of resources to be developed on top. Parliament said it's too hard for council, so we'll give them some rules to do it. And, and the way in which they've done it has essentially, it, it, in my view, is a very rare thing. They have essentially split the kind of middle to progressive consensus in society about how we move forward. There are people who say, this will ruin our environment. And there are people who say there is no other option if we're going to have the density we need so that people can afford more homes. We've heard from Mark that he won't do that. Um, in the Auckland context. In the Auckland context. You'll hear from Generation Zero and others that actually it will do that. Um, it's a fierce dispute now. And it's an unusual position for us to be in because people who used to be allies about all sorts of things are opposed uh, on this. Auckland Council has decided maybe there might be a middle way. Uh, so Auckland Council has said, let's have, let's define special character areas, which are areas that will be exempt from the rules of um, the, the new um, housing and urban development uh, guidelines. Uh, and those special areas, as it happens, are in what you might call the villa suburbs. Now, 
and they're close to the city, and they are lived in by wealthier people. No question about that. And they are also white people, you know, overall. Now, you can argue that's just an historical way to develop, or you can argue that's an historical way to develop as an example of colonialism. You can take either stand on, on these things. It's a really difficult issue now because it's clear there won't be electoral buy-in for widespread uh, density in the way that Parliament uh, had perhaps hoped. Yeah. That will be really, really politically difficult. And in this last week, both National and Labour have both been making signs that maybe they're going to change their thinking. You know, it won't shock me or I'm sure anybody to see next year uh, the position will change on that. However, there's a baby and bathwater issue here, Mark. I wonder if you'd like to comment. But we don't want to throw out the idea that we want density. We don't want to throw out the idea yeah. uh, that um, people should be able to live in a city and live reasonably well without having to go and live in Drury. <coughs> well, effectively, or, what's the attitude for that? What, massive or wherever? We effectively had that um, planning regime anyway, apart from a single house zone, we could already do three houses anywhere. But then we got rid of density controls and all except the single, so this brings. I would have been perfectly happy with the medium density residential standards if it just didn't have that three houses anywhere. It should be. This is the coverage, these are the development controls, which I don't think I, I, I don't like them to you know, they're too aggressive, but I would have been happy with it if they just got rid of three houses. It should be these are the development controls, no resource consent, because you, you're much easier to make a, a thousand square metre section at 50% coverage in three storeys. That's 1,500 square metres of floor plate. But I can only do three houses, so you're going to get three, 300 square metre units where I could do you know, 20 apartments on that site. But I've still got to muck around for a year getting the resource consent. So it was just so, in the Auckland context, it's actually going to hobble developers that are doing density. And, and you know, developers that just do townhouses, and we know who they are, none of which are under the median house prices, they get a free ride straight to building consent. So it's not, I'm, I, I'm not against it because it, we already had density here in Auckland. That's not what's widely known, apart from the single house zone, we already had that here. It's a house zone is pretty widespread though. Was. Yeah, it's, so I, I'm not opposed to that aspect necessarily. It's, it's, it's as a whole, it's very poorly thought out and it's counterintuitive. But I, I'm put my come back in three years, find me a single affordable house that's been built under those, um, under that application of the MRDS. I bet you find out. Larry, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think what's happened is there's been a capture of, of some of the ideas. Of, you know, density was driven by a certain environmental concerns, but I've been captured by a certain economic perspective, which is a very simplified view of economics, that if I, basically if I put three houses on a site, it must be cheaper. And it sends the idea that if you build more, it gets cheaper, but it's not. As Mark has said, it will just, they, will be, they won't be affordable houses because the market provides... It's an excellent mechanism for, for, for providing market houses. It doesn't necessarily produce affordable houses. Because if you, if, you if, you if you cannot meet the market's requirement, you're not, it's not affordable for you. So I think, I think that um, what we've had is a kind of, if we go to the policy context, we go to government, government has been uh, effectively pushed by a set of interests and those interests have pushed, pushed them towards the belief that there is only one solution, and that solution is that which creates a certain form of output in a particular way. In fact, there are different ways of doing it, as Mark has suggested, that they're, that they're, they're missing some of those. Um, just, yeah, it's just that lack of care. It's, it's, it's a lack of care issue. Like It really has hobbled real density apartment developers in our city, is that we've got a market disadvantage against a really old school terraced housing view of but that's the gold standard you see that at Hobsonville it's a car yard that's what we just made everywhere we had car yards everywhere Julie oh so, sorry to interrupt but I've just got a, a question um, about the building Singapore, um, who since the 60s has been building public housing 
for all their people they, who then own them. They have over 80% own, um, ownership of their own home, which I think is one of the highest in the world. And when you talk to them, you say, so we're, we're all people? Or, they say, no, they're all, it's all integrated into the one housing estate or building and within a neighborhood. So it's, it, there's a lovely mix of people and they all have a foot on the, in the building. They all have ownership and they can then trade that. Is there some way do you, that you see that this could be adopted here in New Zealand? Thanks. Just jumping on two things that just in listening to this conversation unfold. Um, uh, what genuine del delights me is that as this conversation has travelled, we begin to move to seeds of hope. Um, uh, your idea or, or what Singapore has done or is doing, there's huge validity in it. I'm not, I, I, I genuinely don't know what would work in our context or not specifically with that, but there is certainly a bloody good idea that's worth exploring. Um, and I think just, just picking up what Larry was saying before, that uh, our, so much of our systems, including our finance and our political systems, have been driven by particular interests. We have power to drive another way. Uh, so we, we are back to those seeds of hope. Um, and what is genuinely so good in this conversation is that it does start to lift to that possibility. And I think the thing that I'm, I should have said in the opening, but I didn't, is that um, to state somewhat the obvious, there is urgency in this uh, on, on two levels. Um, there is an extraordinary financial cost we are paying to keep people homeless. Um, and we're, like we are paying through the tooth for it. Uh, just, just you know, one night in motels, let alone one week, one month, one year. But don't even let me begin on the health costs. It, it's not rocket science uh, to think what it does to your mental or physical health or my mental or physical health when I don't have secure, appropriate, affordable housing. My health is only going one way and therefore we pick up the cost of that health. Now that's only if I put a financial lens on it. it. The urgency even more so comes when I dare to put a people lens on it. Like what we are doing to each other. But the potential that is untapped and the suffering we are creating is extraordinary. Um, and that's on us. Well, connect me to just to, the idea is it's because you can't, we're going to be in a massive recession if you do the radical, I do believe in land taxes, all those things. But the central idea is to reduce the value, the value of a house to what it is for, for living it, to its utility to house a person, a couple, a family, and to actually you know, suckle it off. It's not a financial instrument, it's not an asset, it's not an investment. And then to, to pick up Julie's thing, it, that's a civic idea. Everyone's entitled to help you, we've got that idea. We just lost that idea. And we need to re collectively work to it. Everyone's entitled to housing. We're a wealthy country. So it's, 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 it's just, but it's going to take small incremental chips of that view that housing is just it's just another market it's it's not and there are legislative things that can help that and there are bank attitudes that can help that and there are uh, educational programs that can help that etc etc et but fundamentally it's about a social movement isn't it so well i think it's political issue that? that's that's why i want to raise the I don't want to be straightjacketed into talking about the RMA and construction costs and our labour market and so forth. I, I really do think we've got a... Right. Yes, we've got questions. Okay. I'm just really interested in... There's, there are two issues here. The, the, the latest national policy... Thank you. The latest um, policy statement on the change in density proposed two things. Proposed three houses on the side. That um, would appear to support density, which most of us are probably in favour of. The removal of the need for a reasons consent, which for all the faults of the RMA, I will I don't I, 
I accept there may be many, is still an exercise of care. And so, Mark, when you talk about wanting to remove that particular hurdle that you face, I'm not sure I kind of agree with that. I still believe if we're building 20 apartments on the site, we need all the oversight on that process that um, our laws will allow us. Now, the RNA may not be perfect, but it seems to me that resource management is still at its heart. And, and so I'm really interested because the debate um, has been kind of skewed by conflating the two issues. It's been, you know, it's, it's, mm. And the anti-density argument um, seems to, um, it's, it's sort of mixed up. Does anyone else understand what I'm talking about? Yeah, just, yeah. Um, because <coughs> because and I think it's really important. So when you say you feel a bit miffed, you're clearly miffed because you had to apply for a resource to say, oh, that's kind of the game of thing that you have to apply for a resource to say, because you might be a good developer, but there are plenty out there who are not, who would say, if we put 20 apartments on the site, we'd really mess it up. I, I, I just want to cut you short because I agree with you. Good. I don't, I'm just saying it would have been better if they had got rid of the th three house rule. Yeah, yeah. I, I, overall, I wish that it hadn't. I, I think everyone should go through a resource sure. consent and process. So I'm not. Yeah, I, I, do, I agree with you. I, I, I do think it's a. And so we're back to balancing principles of care yeah. with urgency. Is it, so what I, what I hear is that, that sense of care. Yeah. Christina. Um, I well, one point too is that um, this uh, information about the uh, resource consent in Auckland, because you cannot do a house in Auckland, three houses in Auckland, or even one house on either side in Auckland, without a resource consent, and that's kind of the, the bullshit that we have in Auckland. But as a, as a side, kind of going back to your point about fear, many of us can know what the resolution might be as to land tax land, but how do we have Fear of the politicians that they will lose their election, which is why presumably the Prime Minister locked that out as a possibility. And so we've got to kind of, um, how, how do we talking about the, the social the social movement? I mean, how do we get that movement in the public discourse that that is a good thing to engage in the public good? So, I, I, um I don't know. There is an insight that I can give that may help in the conversation along the way. Um, in the first lockdown that we had two years ago, if you remember, um, if you can take us back two years, we knew very little and our terror was super high and um, everyone had to come indoors. We were very genuinely working with someone who was literally COVID positive in that first round and walking around Auckland City. And I can remember being very, very conscious at the time if I stand aside from the individual tragedy uh, of that individual being sick, is the utter irony that uh, this individual in homelessness full stop is going to have to be attended to because it actually affects literally the health of the whole. <laughs> Uh, and, and it just became very embodied or realised in this individual that literally was walking the streets of Auckland uh, while sick. And what actually were we to do uh, as a city in response? Now, gratefully, we were able to manage it and literally contain it to that individual. But just imagine for a moment if actually we hadn't been able to contain it, uh, particularly in that first lockdown. And it, it is, I believe, again, that canary in the mind situation that says, please listen to our most vulnerable in their experience and allow that to create the urgency that brings these conversations up. It is that urgency or that passion or that refusal to accept anything but a reality where every citizen in our country has a home that is theirs. That urgency is what will create uh, um, politicians that know that the only way they're going to keep a vote is by creating homes. It, it flips it. We are over time, so we are going to finish. But I wonder, Larry, whether you want to pick up on anything that Helen just said or not uh, in relation to your four provocations. Um, do they boil down to a next step? 
<laughs> well, I think Billy on the last point was that, in a sense, uh, we we have made changes in things like the budget, and we saw about welfare elements of the budget. But when it comes to housing, we've got this very simple economic model. It's even simple for property economists; they don't believe it, but but other economists believe it. That somehow it's the demand. You mentioned that you know, we talk about demand supply. So there's a certain there's a certain need to enter into the debate to cause people to actually break open the power of this rhetoric and narrative that dominates once it gets the policy decision. I think most politicians say we need houses, but when they get into parliament, the first thing they're confronted with is a wave of people say the only way you can do it is this way. And and they and they they're and these people are in the industry. So they, they they're challenged by it and that, that's what they felt they had to do. So I think I think there is there is a need to break that logic and somehow it needs to demonstrate and, I, and I've been overseas and I've seen some of the things that are happening in the debates overseas and that's that's that is opening. And the other element of it is I think that we need to challenge the notion that the state has to be a small player, that the market is always going to provide. And that goes back to Singapore. So the Singapore the state is the major player, controls the land market, it auctions the land market. You're not allowed you know, there's no private market, so that's a huge implications. In a sense, the state has monopolized the land, the land, and, and auctions it in particular ways to get its outputs. So I don't know if we could ever go that far, but I do think we should need to be able to consider how can the state be actively involved in ways that produce better outcomes. And I think we need to look at how do we how do we uh, deal with things like the relationship between land and land prices and housing. And if we can divorce some of that speculation on land uh, from the actual cost of housing, I think those, like, maybe some like community land trusts, where we're trying to divorce the relationship between the house and the, and the, and the growth of capital value. These things are all potentials for hope going forward. And can I just finally say yes, something? I've been, in, I've been in many conferences for over 30 years. And I've encountered many, many developers. And I always found Mark, and <laughs> Mark is an example, as someone who, who is actually capable of seeing what, how the system operates and is and honest about, about the development. So I just want to commend Mark for, for some of his clear statements and his willingness to engage in these things. Because often I, I attend, I attend meetings and, and things are said and then we went in the back room and you raise the issue with the person, oh well, I don't believe that. Uh, and, and they say things in order to push an economic view, in order to get things done. Uh, but off, off site they say, oh no, that's not the case. But, but they'll say it publicly. So I, I really want to commend Mark for uh, a willingness to engage with um, the kind of, some of the, the actual dynamics that are happening and willingness to challenge even the accepted Rhetorics that are out there in economics and politics. So, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the talk. Thank you. I wonder if I could just finally say that um, you could you could say that the last two and a half, nearly three years now, we've um, the ways in which we've, as a country, come through this extraordinarily well, and there are ways in which we failed and. You know, the, the, the cliche used to be, we'll build back better, which was a Boris Johnson saying. Um, and we really didn't do that uh, in this country. Um, and we now face a, a local body election where there's a lot of people uh, scared that we might not be able to build back at all. Um, I think um, the people on the stage today, you know, what Mark does, what Helen does, you know, how people like Larry contribute with the analysis and point us forward. I think the work they're doing and, and lots of others are is so important and there's hope strung from it. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to keep talking. We need a bigger, we need a bigger social movement. We need our politicians to understand this is something that is within their kin to help lead, to help frame, to provide the sensible, unifying policy leadership uh, and not simply the leadership, the, the policies that will you know, have us fighting each other all the time. Uh, but that's kind of comes down to, it's back on us, you know, there's work to do.
but I think as you said, Helen, you know, there is hope. You know. So this is, I don't know if you want to get up and say some more at the end of all this, but the first urban room session, I hope you've enjoyed it, I hope you've learned some things from it. Um, I'm personally extremely excited. I've been, Julie and others have been talking to me on and off for a little while now about this whole venture. Having, having an entity you know, that can keep debating and keep building the idea that we can make a better city um, is tremendous for Auckland. Um, so thank you, you guys. Um, and thank you to the speakers today. And thank you to all of you for turning up. It's been great. Thanks. Okay. Very, very quick, but very deeply and sincere thank you to our, our guests today. That was really insightful. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and what's more, so I, I thought so, I get, I'm starting to understand the heart of the problem. So thank you very much for your time and energy today. And thank you, Simon. <laughs> anyway, um, the revolution starts now. <laughs> thank you.